Welcome to the Fitchburg Historical Society's annual meeting. I am Alan Tariba, president of the Fitchburg Historical Society. I will first give a very brief overview of our Zoom meeting as it is a combination of live and pre-recorded sections. When you log into um, the meeting, your uh, microphone will be muted. This is to reduce random noises. Our vice president, Catherine Snyder, will introduce our guest speaker. This will be followed by a pre-recorded video where our speaker will describe the life and the photographs of Ida Wyman. Following the presentation, there will be a live question and answer period between the speaker and viewers. I will then begin our short business meeting. Both FHS members and non-members are welcome. I do want to note that we have to reinstate our dues for, for 2021, which are $10 per person, $12 per family, and $50 for business. I will then give a brief overview of our work over the last year, which has been quite uh, busy despite the pandemic. The minutes and treasurer's reports, which have been sent to members, will be approved. We will finally have nominations and approval of four board members. This will conclude the uh, meeting. Catherine, uh, you can now introduce our um, guest speaker for today. Thank you so much, Alan. I'd like to, first of all, welcome everyone and tell you how fantastic it is to have everyone join this afternoon in our meeting via Zoom for the first time ever for the Fitchburg Historical Society. So we're making history this afternoon as we speak. Um, our speaker uh, has been wonderful to uh, be patient in, in several cancellations due to COVID of uh, plans for having this meeting earlier. And, uh, but she's been uh, just so persevering in, in uh, in uh, being with us uh, through it all. And uh, today is the day we are, are finally able to bring you our program. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Professor uh, Herzog. Uh, Melanie Herzog is Professor Emerita of Art History at Edgewood College and Senior Lecturer in African American Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She holds an MFA in ceramics and a PhD in art history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She received the James R. Uter Colfer Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching Award in 2006 and Edgewood College's Faculty Award for Excellence in Multicultural Education in 2008. With emphasis on race, ethnicity, gender, and cultural and geographic borders, Melanie teaches, publishes, and lectures widely on North American art and visual culture. She is the author of the books, Elizabeth Catlett, an American artist in Mexico by University of Washington Press 2000, and Wilton Rogovin, the making of a social documentary photographer uh, from the Center for Creative Photography 2006 and has published numerous essays on 20th and 21st century U.S. artists, including Elizabeth Catlett, Flo Oi Wong, and photographers Milton Rogovin, Tom Jones, and Ida Wyman. Melanie uh, met Ida Wyman soon after the Madison Museum of Contemporary Arts exhibition, Individual Experience, the photographs of Ida Wyman. Ida had written a memoir, which she shared with Melanie. Melanie worked with Ida to revise sections of this memoir for publication in the catalog that was published to coincide with her 2014 exhibition, Ida Wyman, Chords of Memory, at the James Walrus Gallery of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters in Madison. As well, Melanie worked with Ida and with exhibition curator, Martha Glowacki to select images for the Walrus Gallery exhibition and her essay, Ida Wyman, Chords of Memory, was published in both the catalog and in the winter 2014 issue of the Wisconsin Academy's journal, Wisconsin People and Ideas. And so with great pleasure, I present our speaker for today, Professor Melanie Herzig. 
thank you to Catherine Schneider and the Fitchburg Historical Society for inviting me to speak to you this afternoon about the photographs of Ida Wyman, who spent her last years living here in Wisconsin, in Madison and then in Fitchburg until her passing in July of 2019. She moved here in 2006 to be closer to members of her family. Her daughter lives in Madison and her granddaughter and great grandsons live in Fitchburg. It didn't take long for the presence of this eminent photographer to be recognized in our community. In 2008, the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art presented an exhibition of her photographs called Individual Experience, the photographs of Ida Wyman. And in 2014, the James Watrous Gallery of the Wisconsin Academy of Sciences, Arts and Letters hosted a major exhibition of her work, Ida Wyman, Chords of Memory in 2014. I will show you quite a few examples of her work today. To start with, here are two to give you an initial sense of the range of her documentation of human activities and emotions, the presence of people in these vignettes of life at mid-century for which she is best known. I met Ida sometime after seeing her 2008 exhibition at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art, and I had the honor of working with her to select photographs for her Watrous Gallery exhibition. And I also had the honor of writing an essay for the catalog that accompanied this exhibition. And we became friends. I am deeply honored to speak to you today about her life and her photography. The hundreds of photographs she made depicting Americans from all walks of life place her among the ranks of leading American documentary photographers a lineage that begins in the United States with photographers Jacob Rees and Lewis Hine. The late 19th century newspaper reporter and social reformer Jacob Rees dedicated his life to the elimination of slums and the improvement of building codes in New York City. Rees used photography, then a relatively novel tool, to bring attention to the plight of people living in the slums and tenements of New York City. Today, Rees is best known for his book, How the Other Half Lives, Studies Among the Tenements of New York, in which photographs made by Rees and other photographers document the squalid conditions of Lower East Side tenement houses. Rees is remembered as one of the first documentary photographers in the United States, but it was sociologist turned photographer Lewis Hine from Oshkosh who brought to documentary photography a deeply human empathy for the individuals he photographed, coupled with a finely attuned aesthetic sensibility. In Hines' work, as in Wyman's, we find the unique combination of, in the words of Mason Klein, a curator at the Jewish Museum of New York, realism and aesthetic presence that is so essential to documentary photography as we know it today. The photographs that Hine made for the National Child Labor Committee from 1908 until 1916 of children at work in mills, in mines, and on the farms and city streets of this country were instrumental in changing child labor laws, and his images of sweatshop workers aided the passage of work reform legislation. He later created a series of photographs that depicted men and women at work emphasizing the importance and dignity of human beings in the process of industrial production. Near the end of his life, Hein said, there were two things I wanted to do. I wanted to show the things that had to be corrected. I wanted to show the things that had to be appreciated. While Ida Wyman began as a maker of individual images, she, like Hein, came to conceive of her photojournalistic projects as picture stories, what are today called photo essays, rather than as individual images. And like Hein, she envisioned multiple photographs of a subject or situation as the most effective means to tell a story in pictures. But let's start at the beginning. Ida Wyman was born in 1926 in Malden, Massachusetts, the daughter of Jewish immigrants from Latvia in Eastern Europe. The family soon moved to New York where her parents ran a small grocery store in the Bronx. In her memoir, part of which was published in her Chords of Memory, Watrous Gallery exhibition catalog, she described her family's store as the center of the childhood world she shared with her brother. And I'll read you a little bit of this description. We took turns eating in the back of the store. 
a place crammed with unopened boxes of canned goods taking up most of the space. One small corner had a sink, an enamel top table, a two burner gas stove, and one chair. If my brother and I wanted to eat at the same time, one of us had to sit on the cartons. Practically all of our meals cooked on the two burner were eaten here since my mother worked almost the same long hours as my father. My mother prepared food with one eye on her stove and the other alert for customers. She was observant and inquisitive about the world around her as she wrote, quote, I was always curious about people, about how things work. When she was 14 years old, Wyman begged her parents for money to buy a camera and began photographing people and buildings in her neighborhood. She joined the Walton High School Camera Club, learned how to develop and print film, and bought an inexpensive enlarger so that she could print at home using the family's kitchen as a darkroom. The camera club's faculty advisor invited Life Magazine staff photographer Bernard Hoffman to speak to the students. He encouraged Wyman to pursue a career in photography and he later became a friend. She wrote in her memoir, quote, in the end, it was because of Bernie that I became a nationally published photographer at a time when few women did this work and they were not welcomed by their male counterparts. Picture magazines like Life and Look, in which photographic narratives comprised most of the content, were Wyman's introduction to photography as a means of telling visual stories about the world. Since their advent in the 1930s, these magazines had become important venues for documentary photographers. And significantly, these picture magazines offered women photographers more opportunities than did newspapers and picture agencies, particularly during World War II, when women took on the types of photographic projects previously assigned to men. Life magazine, founded in 1936, published thousands of photo essays by photographic luminaries, such as Dorothea Lange and Margaret Bourke White, whose photograph of the Fort Peck Dam was featured on the cover of the inaugural issue. From 1936 until 1972, when it ceased weekly publication, Life magazine accumulated an unparalleled archive of several million photographs. Wyman graduated from high school in 1943, shortly before her 17th birthday. She planned to become a nurse, but she was too young to, att to attend nursing school. She didn't envision a career as a photographer, but she was proud of her high school photographic and darkroom experience, and she was certain she would find work as a staff photographer with one of New York's many newspapers. Yes, this was the era when cities had multiple newspapers. During her job hunt, an editor at Acme News Pictures told her that all Acme staff photographers had begun their careers in the mailroom. This was 1943, and at the time, many Acme staffers were in the armed services, providing the opportunity Wyman needed. She became the agency's first girl mailroom boy, pulling prints from the large commercial print dryers, squeegeeing them dry, pasting captions on the back, and distributing them into boxes for Acme's subscribers. She was soon promoted to printer, joining the all-male photo printing staff, most of whom resisted the addition of what they called a girl to their ranks. Still, she recalled, the job was thrilling. And here are two images of her at work during those years at Acme. She soon purchased a camera. It was a three and a quarter by four and a quarter Grayflex speed graphic camera, which is slightly smaller and less expensive than the four by five speed graphic that was the standard camera at the time for professional news photographers. And she bought a leather case and film holders and film. She wrote, quote, hefting that case onto my shoulder made me feel truly professional. I'd load up my film holders in the Acme darkroom and set out looking for pictures on my lunch hours. Here are a couple of these early pictures. She also photographed office workers and laborers on their lunch breaks, men at work in the nearby garment district and people in the streets. Life was in the streets, she said. Nobody thought of it as street photography. Most photographers' photos were out of doors. 
The photographs that she made were shaped by her incisive observations of human interaction within this lively urban landscape. And also she portrayed moments of quiet introspection. She recalled, quote, wearing the camera trumped my shyness. It enabled me to talk to complete strangers and hear their stories. I wasn't threatening and I wore saddle shoes with bobby socks. She also wrote, quote, I saw the street more clearly carrying the camera, became more aware of the sun forming interesting textures and designs on the varied architecture, the expressions on faces, the hustle and bustle created by crowds intent on their destination. The vitality of urban street life is a prominent theme in her photographs of her New York environs, where she captured these vignettes of life at mid-century, including unforgettable historical moments, as in this photograph of a group of men reading the Yiddish newspaper, The Daily Forward, following the death of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt on April 12th, 1945. After three years at ACME, Wyman realized that she did not want to be a news photographer. Instead, she wanted to work for those picture magazines as more photographs were used in these than in newspapers. And she knew she would always learn something new about her subjects. So she began assigning herself photographic narratives. And in 1945, she told, sold her first picture story to Look Magazine. One of the assignments that she gave herself was to photograph the, the welcomes home of those who had served during the war. Signs adorning businesses and homes as you see here with flags and all sorts of celebratory um, emblems. And she also photographed celebrations in the street. As often as she could, Wyman took pictures and some were published. In the fall of 1945, as men returned from military service, she was dismissed from her job at ACME and she began her career as a professional photographer. In 1946, she married Simon Nathan, an ACME staff photographer who left ACME later that year to build his career as an independent photographer. Though work for freelance photographers wasn't steady, Nathan gained commercial clients and Wyman increasingly received assignments from Life and other magazines. And here are a couple of her photographs from this time. So meanwhile, Morris Engel, a photographer for PM or Photo Magazine and a member of New York's Storied Photo League was a friend of Simon Nathan's. At her husband's suggestion, Wyman began attending a group run by Morris Engel and then she joined the Photo League. These two photographs that she made while she was a member of the Photo League show her incisive eye for what French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson called the decisive moment and her attentiveness to composition, tonality, focal point, form and pattern and rhythm, the visual language of photography. Participation in the Photo League didn't alter Wyman's already prolific practice of photographing life as she saw it happening around her. Rather, it was where she says she, quote, learned that photos could be used to effect change. She was a member for just two years. She left because she was increasingly busy with magazine assignments, but her affinity for the aims of the Photo League is apparent in her work. Here's what she said. I considered myself a documentary photographer and the League's philosophy of honest photography appealed to me. I also began to understand the power of photographs to help improve the social order by showing the conditions under which many people lived and worked. Even after leaving the League the following year, I continued to emphasize visual and social realities in my straightforward photographs. While some members of the Photo League sought to use photography to challenge issues such as racial inequality, war, and poverty, the group's focus turned more toward experimental aesthetics over time. And we see this certainly in Wyman's Sidewalk Clock, New York. Yet with the onset of the Red Scare immediately after World War II, the Photo League was targeted and was blacklisted in 1947. With a dwindling membership, it was forced to disband in 1951. 
Nonetheless, the Photo League remains widely lauded today for its invaluable contributions to documentary photography. Writing in Photo Notes, the Photo League newspaper in 1939, art historian and critic Elizabeth McCausland introduced the term documentary photography to differentiate photography that presents factual evidence, what she called the vanguard of photography today, from photography as artistic expression. McCausland spoke to the social climate of the depression years as she described documentary photography as, quote, an application of photography direct and realistic dedicated to the profound and sober chronicling of the external world, unquote. McCausland invoked Jacob Rees and Lewis Hine as the progenitors of photography as visual testimony. And she disparaged movements in art photography, such as pictorialism and subsequent modernist experiments. And here's what she said. We have all had a surfeit of pretty pictures of romantic views of hillsops, seaside, rolling fields, skyscrapers seen askew, picturesque bits of life torn out of their sordid context. In contrast, she continued, it is life that is exciting and important and life whole and unretouched. By virtue of this new spirit of realism, photography looks now at the external world with new eyes, the eyes of scientific, uncompromising honesty." Unquote. During the 1930s, many photographers documented the effects on ordinary people of the hardships wrought by the economic crisis of the Great Depression and the ecological catastrophe of the Dust Bowl. Wyman said she admired these photographs because they show the reality of things as they were, her principal goal as a photographer. Under President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, photographers employed by the Resettlement Administration, which became the Farm Security Administration in 1937, produced as many as 270,000 photographs. These programs, the Resettlement Administration and the Farm Security Administration, were created to alleviate rural poverty exacerbated by the depression, by the industrialization of farming, and by the Dust Bowl. And they employed photographers such as Dorothea Lang, whose work you see here, and Walker Evans, here are two of his photographs, to produce images that would raise public awareness and gain congressional support for their efforts. Photographer Edward Steichen called these incisively critical images of the downtrodden and the dispossessed quote, the most remarkable human documents ever rendered in pictures. Yet Wyman's work, which I return to here, uh, displays a broader affinity with her photo league contemporaries who sought subjects across a broader social spectrum within their contemporary urban landscape than with the Farm Security Administration photographers. In diverse neighborhoods, she photographed elements of architecture, as you see here, and other images she found compelling, along with a range of social interactions and moments of focused solitude. Her images of people on the move, like Waiting for the Trolley, Chicago, suggest the resurgence of social mobility in the post-war years. Her photographs are at once exquisitely composed and engaging in their visual language and their suggested narratives. While people within their own social environment are most often her focus, she also attended to the details, the architectural embellishments, the commercial signs, utilitarian objects that balance a composition and provide visual interest and also ground these images in their place and time. She never looked down on her subjects, visually or socially. There's, there's intimacy in her work, and there's sometimes a kind of gentle irony, but not the sardonic recording of people who she cast as outsiders or misfits that are characteristic of the work of some of her contemporaries, like the street photographers Lisette Modell, whose images she occasionally found invasive, she said, or um, the, the crime scene photographer, Ouija, who she came to know um, in Los Angeles. In 1948, at the age of 22, Wyman decided to travel across the United States by bus. 
her trip to major cities and small towns was planned around assignments and included places about which she was curious, and some like Vandalia, Illinois, because she liked the name. She traveled alone, taking more than two weeks to get from New York City to Laredo, Texas, and then she continued on to Mexico City. Throughout her journey, she photographed voraciously, and here are two of her photographs from, from her time in Mexico. When she returned from her travels, she worked for Business Week, Fortune Magazine, Collier's, Saturday Evening Post, a Sunday newspaper supplement called This Week, and also for Life and other magazines. And she also had some commercial clients. But she wanted most of all to see her photographs in print in Life because it was the premier picture magazine at that time. So on the advice of Life editor Ruth Lester, Wyman set off for the magazine's Los Angeles Bureau, where there were fewer photographers competing for assignments. She worked in Los Angeles for two years in 1949 and 1950. Though she spent some time in Los Angeles with her husband, she was mostly there working by herself. Her husband continued to pursue his own career in New York, but here are a couple of photographs he made of her in LA, one at the Burbank Airport and the other with the photographer Arthur, Arthur Felig, who was known as Ouija. In Los Angeles, Wyman became known as the girl photographer from Life Magazine. She photographed a range of subjects for Life, many of which she was likely assigned because of her gender. She photographed a young actress's tennis lesson, the world's largest rummage sale, a woman's club tea party, and we see these women in her photograph, women in hats. Her cover story, A Day at the Beach, featuring a high school girl and a handsome lifeguard frolicking on the Santa Monica beach, ran in the July 4th, 1949 issue, and she returned to the beach often. Um, she photographed this boy nearly silhouetted against the water and sky the following year. She also photographed movies being filmed, including White Heat, starring James Cagney, A Place in the Sun, starring Elizabeth Taylor and Montgomery Clift, and that's his hand holding on to Elizabeth Taylor's hand, and Bedtime for Bonzo, featuring Ronald Reagan and Bonzo the Chimpanzee. And in 1950, she was assigned to cover the US Senate race between Helen Gahagan Douglas and Richard Nixon. And of course, here is Nixon. One of her favorite Life magazine assignments began as a story about an increase in marriages during the Korean War, a story in which she became a key actor. So while I'm showing you these pages from Life magazine of her picture story, I'll read you her description of what transpired because it's such a great story and it gives a feel for the energy that she brought to her work and also for her, for her empathy and her compassion for her subject. So here's what she wrote. I had already shot the crowds and couples waiting in line, filling out forms or holding hands when I met Bob, a Marine, and his bride-to-be, Beverly, both from Seattle. He was leaving for Camp Pendleton to be shipped off somewhere else the following day. They desperately wanted to be married before he left for overseas, but they could not get a license that day because they hadn't obtained the necessary blood test. Suddenly, I realized I could probably help them. First, I got permission from the life office to continue on this story. And then I called a judge whom I had photographed on another assignment. After he heard about the couple, he agreed not only to waive the blood test, but to marry them in his chambers that afternoon. There was yet another problem. Neither Bob nor Beverly had brought enough money for their wedding rings. I rushed back to the life office, got money from petty cash, and we all went to a jewelry store to buy one. Then we rushed over to the judge's chambers. After the ceremony, the couple invited me to go with them to Camp Pendleton. Bob asked me to come see him off in the morning saying, you're part of the family. I did, photographing the newlyweds poignant farewell. With three pages of photographs, this photo essay ran in the September 25th, 1950 issue of Life with the title, Two Kids Who Had So Little Time a Korea-bound Marine and his girl are wed and then parted as the war marriage business booms again. 
Occasion characteristically, Wyman also explored Los Angeles alone with her camera. She photographed lively street scenes that convey the energy of mid-century Los Angeles, and she also made quieter, more reflective images of people she encountered, honoring the humanity of these photographic subjects, such as this woman with her pet birds. Her beautifully lit and elegantly composed photograph, Florentine with Baby's Cap, shows her attention to the tonal range of photography, as well as her capacity to engage, to engage her subjects intimately, but without invasion or exploitation. She traversed Los Angeles on foot and remembered photographing in an area of the city where, in the path of a freeway under construction, intricately ornamented houses were being destroyed and their residents displaced. In a Mexican-American neighborhood called La Loma, she made friends with several people and was invited into their homes and to local clubs to hear music and to dance. She remembered, quote, the dusty streets of La Loma and the people are an important part of my Los Angeles memories. Children were friendly, curious, and willing to have me photograph them. I never tried to hide the camera, and I took pictures when people seemed comfortable. From my own background, I understood the reality of life in La Loma, the struggle to survive. From 1947 through 1951, Wyman completed nearly 100 assignments for Life magazine, and her photographs also appeared in other widely read publications. She expected to continue working for these magazines after she returned to New York to resume her married life. But Wyman found herself unable to accept assignments after the birth of her children due to the consuming demands of parenting and domestic work. With her career on hold, her husband's career continued and Wyman assisted him with printing and other organizational tasks. Sometimes he cared for the children so she could work for commercial clients, but her, her own photographs were most often of her own children. This career pause, what felt to Wyman like the end, was not unique. In the 1950s, women were expected to postpone or cancel their careers in deference to the needs of husbands and children. Though she had taken the bold step in her early 20s of traveling alone across the United States and Mexico and had worked independently and apart from her husband as a photographer in Los Angeles, there was a kind of inevitability to her decision to return to New York and raise a family. The careers of many other women photographers active during the 1940s and early 1950s also ended in this manner. And the work of too many has been forgotten. Then, after a decade as a homemaker, Wyman returned to work. I was a good mother, she said, but I was also a good photographer. She also returned to photographing life around her, but she couldn't accept assignments that required travel because she had children to tend to. To make a living, she worked as a photographer of scientific research projects for Haskins Laboratory in New York, and then as chief photographer for the Department of Pathology at Columbia University, making black and white as well as color photographs for teaching and publication. After leaving Columbia University in 1983 to return to freelance photography, she sought assignments from the New York Times and other newspapers to get the credit line that would enable her to once again go after magazine work. I was starting over, she said, but I could still shoot pictures. And I think that's evident here. But by the 1990s, years of carrying heavy camera equipment had taken their toll and with severe back pain, Wyman could no longer pursue these freelance assignments. Instead, she turned to shooting stock photography, working in black and white and color. Also, visits to exhibitions of historic and contemporary photography impelled her to approach New York galleries with her own work. The art world's acknowledgement of the aesthetic as well as social dimensions of documentary photography and photojournalism brought an increasing attention to Wyman's photographs, which have been exhibited in art museums and galleries throughout the United States and abroad. Her photographs can be found in collections around the world, from New York to Spain, and of course, in Madison. 
the lasting legacy of Ida Wyman's photographs derives from their aesthetic force, as well as their incisive and compassionate visual recording of the dynamic energy of urban life, quiet human dramas, and moments of solitude. Her photographic vignettes of life in urban centers and small towns in the United States illuminate their mid 20th century historical moment while providing a deeply humanist perspective on her subjects. These images chronicle life as Wyman photographically witnessed, experienced, and interpreted it as she walked the streets of New York City and other locales and traveled on her own across the country. Her photographs reveal the extraordinary within what at first glance might appear to be otherwise unremarkable. They're a testament to her deep empathy and her abiding curiosity about the human condition and the complexity of human experience, both familiar and unfamiliar. She wrote, details of the daily life of children and adults at work at play have always gripped me. My lively curiosity to see and know was a strong motivator in my shooting as well for assignments. The camera has been the door through which I entered the lives of the people I met. Despite the technical wonders of photography, I believe that the camera coupled to heart and mind can still reveal the beauty of our fellow humans on their daily rounds. Thank you for, for listening, for looking, for being here today and for your attention to the beauty of our fellow humans in Ida Wyman's Vignettes of Life. Thank you, Professor Herzig, for that beautiful presentation. We are now going to move into our question and answer period. Um, uh, but before we do that, uh, board member Adrian Imakowski has something to add in the way of her personal uh, contact with um, uh, with Ida Wyman. So, Adrian, would you like to uh, would you like to uh, take it over with your uh, with your presentation? Your story? Uh, yes, thank you very much, Catherine, for uh, allowing me to do this now. Um, I met Ida many years ago. I don't, I'm not exactly sure how long ago that was, but it was through uh, Jewish Social Services um, have luncheon for seniors, and you're expected to discuss with the people at your table during lunch. And Ida was the elderly lady next to me at the table. And so we started talking. And the first thing we found out is that her parents had a grocery store and so did my parents. So we could talk about that. And she was very happy to talk about it. Ida was very conversant and informed about what she said at all times. So we became friends that day and stayed friends throughout the end of her life. I didn't know that she was a photographer when I first met her, but she viewed the world with a photographer's eye when she realized that, you know, she could travel with us instead of getting on the bus to get to activities. So we became her pseudo travel parents during the time that she needed transportation. And she was always happy to converse on any subject. I have one vignette about dealing with Ida in real life. We were privileged to be invited to her 90th birthday at Hotel Red. And she said right away, you do not have to bring a gift because um, no gifts are expected, just come. Well, my husband decided he was going to get her a gift. So he bought a walking stick and said, Ida's going to love this. We went to the party and then we, a few days later, we picked her up and we gave her the walking stick. And she looked at us quizzically and said, and then I said to her, that's Joe's gift, but I bought you a gift certificate. She, hand, she took the gift certificate for me and we spent it that day 
and she handed the walking stick back to Joe and said, here, Joe, you may need this later. I still have the walking stick. He ne she never used it, and he never used it. But we enjoyed talking about it over the years, and that was Ida. She was a fun person, a very loving person who loved her family and people in the world, and I miss her. Back to you, Catherine. Thank you, Adrian. What a lovely personal story of Ida. It gives us a, a chance to get to know her in a, in a one-to-one -one relationship with you. How fortunate you were to have her as a friend. Thank you. So we'll now we'll now take um, take uh, questions for um, for Melanie. And so, if you'd like to enter questions under chat, it's also possible to uh, just raise your hand, and uh, we will take those as they come in. So please feel free. And while other people are kind of getting questions together or thoughts that you might want to put in the chat, or you might want to raise your hand to ask a question. I just want to thank you all again for being here. And I want to thank Catherine for inviting me. This is, this is such a thrill and an honor to be able to spend this time with you talking about Ida Wyman and her work. And um, like Adrian said, I, I miss her too. She was amazing. And I was also at that birthday party. So maybe we met there. Um, she was just a fantastic, generous, giving, immensely curious, human being who always had something interesting to talk about right up to the end of her life when her movement was so constrained and she wasn't really going anywhere, but in her mind she was and in her conversations she was and in her interactions with people she was because she just had this, she had this passion to know about people and this curiosity about people and she would just ask the most marvelous questions. Can I? Can I add something? Sure. Um, the I was I was involved in with a lot of photojournalists, and it seems as though the whole profession of photojournalism has evolved from uh, Ida was one of the pioneers, and that the photojournalism has become taught. Uh, street photographer, street photography, and things like that. And it, it's just a, the evolution. I think she was at the beginning of the evolution, and because of Life magazine, probably. But this, this is where journalism is headed now. And you look at the pictures in the Wisconsin State Journal, and they're all, they're kids, you know, they, they the, the photographers just go out and take pictures of kids and so on. So um, they, they're, they, they do what, what uh, Ida did many years later. That's a really I, good point. And I would add they do what Ida did with one difference. If they're photographing digitally, they can take a whole lot more pictures and then just choose the good one. And... Um, I think I think people on this call, just sort of looking at everybody's faces, I'm guessing we all remember film photography. But I know when I'm talking with students, and when I was at Edgewood, I taught a course on the history of photography. And it was really hard to get students who've grown up exclusively with digital photography. You know, they can just whip out their phones and make a zillion pictures of everything. And to get them to understand that when you have film in your camera, you have to be very thoughtful about what images you're going to make because film costs money. And so, and also, you don't want to run well, your roll of film in two seconds and then have to stop and change your film. So a photographer like Ida Wyman or her colleagues in the field back in the days, and you know this, of, of film photography had to be much more discerning. And so to be able to get those decisive moments, to record those decisive moments was no small thing because you have to be, when you're working with film, you have to be so attentive to 
what's going on in terms of human interactions and the background against which that's all happening so that you are catching the moment. And that's a skill that I think now you just keep your camera going and then you'll be able to pick out some <laughs> all those photos. But that's another piece of what you're saying that I think is really important to remember is the skill that it takes. And I know there are some other photographers on this call too. So um, the skill that it takes when you are working with, when you're working with film. So thank you for, for those comments. If I may introduce you something know. else, I would like to uh, let you know about the impact of Life Magazine. My mother had almost every copy of Life Magazine from 1937 until Life Magazine wow. ended. I know that because we had to empty her garage space when she passed away and we threw away <laughs> all of those magazines, which are now worth something because it's now and not then. But she lived through the pictures that she saw in Life Magazine because my mother never left her neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. So Life Magazine was her outlook on the world. And she would have been very proud to know that her daughter had contact with a person who photographed in the magazine that she loved. But what amazed me when I set up the display case for this presentation and set up contact with the outside world about Ida, my daughter in California called and said, gee, mom, that's great. I know all about Ida's photographs. And I didn't develop that, but here are three generations of women that have contact with Ida somehow, but the two of them didn't even know her. So that's the impact that she had on the world and on people. And it happened in three generations in my family. That is amazing. And it looks like Nancy, daughter of Ida is typing a comment in the chat. Nancy, did you want to unmute and share what you typed in the chat or do you want me to read it? So this is Nancy, Nancy Nathan, daughter of Ida Wyman. And this is in response to um, the question that Lewis had raised. So this is what Nancy says. She said, my mom never stayed in touch with the young couple she helped get married, but she did put Anna's in a Chinatown newspaper, ads in a Chinatown newspaper asking if anyone knew the woman and child in the picture. She loved connecting people back with, connecting back with people through her pictures and her travels. That is lovely, thank you. Thank you for that, that's great. I have a... You should mute yourself, there you go. Here we go. Mute Audio. There we go. Uh, it looks like we're connected. I, I wanted to throw in a few comments also. In the decade and a half that we were associated with Ida, uh, she was the, the, the perfect Jewish mother to me, giving me advice and uh, calming me down sometimes. Also, we don't really realize that she was developing, she was processing these photos that she made all these years, mm -hmm. uh, which I regard as amazing. So we miss her so. Yes, thank you for that. And I had showed the image of her as a young woman working at Acme News Pictures in the, in the dark room. And she did continue on to uh, develop her own film and 
print her own photographs in her negative. So yes, thank you for that. So I'll just ask you, are there any other uh, questions or comments? Well, I'd like to uh, just say uh, a huge thank you to, um, to Melanie for being here with us this afternoon and recording that wonderful presentation. It gives us uh, insight into uh, who Ida was who Ida was and what motivated her in terms of her uh, amazing photography and her um, being a pioneer in the field of street photography, but also to have that insight into her as a person and her marvelous insight into um, human nature and her keen interest in, uh, in people. Uh, so all of that came through through your wonderful presentation and uh, and then, then the personal stories that also were shared here this afternoon. So thank you so much, Melanie. It was just a pleasure to uh, have you with us with the Fitchburg Historical Society for our for our spring program that was a year and a half in the making <laughs> so that we could we could finally have it over Zoom. So our our deep uh, deep appreciation uh, for your presence with us this afternoon. Well, thank and you. And I, I will... Uh, Thank you. Thank you all so much. And thank you for having me. And um, at some point when we're all back together in person again, if there's another Fitchford related topic you would like me to come back and talk about, it would be such an honor to get to be with you all in person. I've enjoyed this so much. And the only thing that could have possibly made it better would have been for us to all be in the same room together. So perhaps at some point we can make that happen. And Thank you very much for inviting me. I wish you all the best and um, have a good meeting. I'm gonna take off and, and let you get on with your annual meeting, but um, my best wishes to everybody. Stay, stay safe and healthy. Thank you so Thank much, you. Melanie. And now I'll turn it back to Alan, our president, uh, for our, our very brief business meeting. So Alan. Thank you, uh, Catherine and Melanie. Um, that was a very nice talk. and. I, I'm sort of a photographer, and I really enjoyed how <clears throat> beautiful the, um, she's able to, to get pictures. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you. We will now begin our business meeting. With the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. the last year has been anything but normal. With uh, the library closed, we have been unable to enter our historical society office use our computer or go through our files. Our board was also unable to keep, um, was unable to meet in person. Fortunately, we have an offsite backup of our digital database. So we were able to view and add to that database. In addition, our website data is stored on the WordPress servers. So we were able to edit and add our website from an off-site computer. Over the last year, we have added 19 articles to our website, from short stories to long articles on a wide variety of topics. I want to thank all the contributors and remind everyone that you can submit a story about the historical or present-day Fitchburg. In addition, we have added to our website 90 obituaries 43 photographs, three newsletters, and five interviews recorded by Pittsburgh Spec TV. Our 12 board members have kept in touch by having Zoom board meetings every other month and have exchanged many emails and phone calls. I will now ask if there are any corrections or questions on the 2019 annual meeting. Are there any questions to the minutes that were sent out? Hearing none, uh, is there a motion to approve the 2019 annual minutes? Yeah. Okay, I hear a, uh, see a hand. 
Is there a second? You can raise your hand or, okay, second. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed, uh, the minutes have been approved. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> we will now ask if there are any corrections or questions on the treasurer's report. Anyone have any questions on that? <clears throat> Seeing uh, no hands, uh, is there a motion to approve the treasurer's report? There's a hand, is there a second? <clears throat> There's a second. All those in favor, raise your hand. All opposed? Uh, the treasurer's report has been approved. <clears throat> our, for our final business, we will now turn to electing four board members for a three-year term. Carol Kinney will conduct the selection. Carol? Uh, the board of the Fitchburg Historical Society has 12 members, and the members are elected for three years. So each year, four members' terms are up. They may run again if they wish. Now, we consulted with the four people whose terms would be up, and three of the four are willing to run again. And these are the three, Catherine Schneider, Alan Tariba, and Eileen keller Lederman. The fourth one uh, would be Rich Eggleston, and he's pretty busy with the Dane County Historical Society, so he does not wish to run again. So at this time, I would like to take nominations from the floor. If there's someone that you would like to nominate, please raise your hand. Okay, I guess according to Robert's rules, I have to ask this about three times. Uh, if there's anyone who would like to run, would you please raise your hand? I don't see anyone. And I don't see anyone now. So would someone move that the nominations be closed? of these three people, Catherine, Allen, and Eileen, to remain on the board, please. I so move, close the nominations for the three, leaving one position open. Thank you, Tom. Do we have a second then? There's a second. Can you raise your hand? Anyone? There's. Okay. Thank you, Bart. Um, any opposed? No, then the motion is carried. So congratulations to Catherine, Alan, and Eileen, uh, who will continue. Um, each member we've learned over the years, you know, comes with a special talent or talents, and they're so willing to share them. And we do have a good time on the board. I think we'll all admit that. So if you think about later, gee, maybe I would like to be on the board, give a member of the board a call, any one of us, okay? If you have second thoughts that maybe you'd like to be on the board. Because we do enjoy it and we will be minus one member. So if you're interested, please let us know. I guess that's it, Ellen. Thank you very much, uh, Carol. Um, is there any other um, business? If not, uh, do I uh, have a motion to adjourn? Someone raise their hand. So is there a second? Raise your hand, second. All those uh, um, approving the adjournment of this meeting, raise your hand. All opposed? Motion carries. Our business meeting is now adjourned. I want to thank everyone for helping to put this on. Thank you very much.